Intel's really getting into gear. On November 4th, Intel will be launching its two Alder Lake CPUs. We have these specs and the pricing of the first CPUs in that lineup for you. This is Intel's first big attempt by our look at it anyway, of responding to AMD's Ryzen CPU since about the 8700K. It's been pretty boring since then, and there's been a lot of wastes of sand from both parties, but especially Intel mixed in in the last few years. Alder Lake is a lot different, though. It's a massive architectural change. This could go two ways. Extremely well, they could end up very competitive, or it could go poorly, depending on how well things like thread scheduling work out for the more complicated core layout of Alder Lake. Today, we're going to be talking about these specs, the pricing, the release date, and some other information, give you a bit more of our thoughts on how this will all work out. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. We use Squarespace for our own GN store and juggle complex multi-piece orders all the time with it. Squarespace makes it fast for us to roll out new products with detailed pages full of galleries, videos, and descriptors. It's also useful for your own resume sites, for photographer or project portfolios, or for starting your new small business idea. There's never been a better time to try and start your new business than right now. And we can vouch that Squarespace makes it easy. Visit squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. So we've already gone over the architecture in a separate video. That went up a while ago. It hasn't changed. The only information that's really new today is, again, price, specs, release date. We're going to go through all that. Architecture, the biggest difference as a very quick recap is that Intel now has performance cores and efficient cores. So this is very different from the traditional sort of one type of core that's focused on one type of thin design that Intel has traditionally used. AMD very recently did a five years of Zen video where it recommitted to sticking with its existing chiplet and single Zen type of core design, stating that basically, yes, we know people do big and little cores like an Android, but we're not going to do that. AMD is sticking with what it does now with the Zen architecture. Intel is obviously what AMD is referring to, Intel going the opposite direction, mixing two types of cores. So we have a piece on that. Not going to go through it all again. It's the same. Check it out in the link in the description below. Patrick Stone on our team wrote most of that, and uh, he has a computer engineering background, so he did a great job analyzing it and really explaining it, breaking it out in detail if you want to learn something uh, about computers in general, but also about Intel's processors. So that'll be there. Getting straight into the specs then. This is the important part today. Uh, specs pricing release date, November 4th is the release date. Unfortunately, Intel has decided to lift the reviews embargo, the time at which reviews can go live, at the same time as the product's going for sale. So that's great. Now if you think you might want to buy it, you're basically just going to have to buy it. And then if you watch the reviews after you buy it, you'll either need to convince yourself that you made the right choice by posting a comment on everyone's review saying how wrong they are if, in fact, it didn't work out in favor of the CPU you bought, or you'll have to cancel the order if you don't like it. So we actually genuinely don't know how it's going to perform yet. We haven't done the testing yet. So this isn't me being coy or anything. But the fact of the matter is that typically you want to see reviews go up at least a little bit ahead of a launch um, so that people have some time to make an informed decision, especially in a market where they're all going to sell anyway. Because then all Intel's really doing is creating a scenario where people are going to buy it in a panic because it's going to get scalped otherwise or whatever. And then they'll be upset if they're not happy with it. So allowing people that extra time to make the informed decision isn't really going to hurt sales here because they're all going to sell. But anyway, that's a weird read of the market by Intel. Uh, so into the specs, Intel announced the 12900K and KF. No word yet on the popular KFC SKU. We know of at least one customer that would be very interested in these, but haven't heard from Intel about them. There's also the 12700K and KF and a 12600K and KF, and that's what they have for now. If you're not aware, uh, the K and the KF SKU, so K just means unlocked. It means you can overclock it uh, with certain motherboards anyway. And then F means that it has no IGP. So there's no integrated graphics processor in a KF model. Uh, that is a cost-saving measure if you're not going to need it for troubleshooting quick sync or something else. Uh, in additional ways that Intel is saying F SKU, the pricing was announced as a big F SKU. So uh, the first F SKU is $564. That's the 12900K F SKU from Intel. There's the 12900K non F for $589. Now, talking with Patrick before filming this, we've come to the conclusion that since it has both P cores and E cores, really it's two processors. So you're getting a great deal there. 
At least that's how we would spin it if we worked at Intel. The 12700K, $409. This is maybe a little bit more typical, but still uh, a little bit on the high side. Not nearly as bad, though. The 12700KF, $384. Getting close to normality now. 12600K is in a better spot. 289 or 264 for the KF. So the 12600, we do have a bit of hope for as a competitor to the 5600X because the 5600X launched at 300. It's more or less been at 300, occasionally plus or minus 40, depending on active deals, things like that. So this should hopefully be a good competitor to the 5600X. There was a leak of some benchmarks about the 12400. Intel has not officially discussed the 12400 or confirmed its existence at this time that we're aware of, uh, at least not in the most recent press briefing. And from the leaks, it looks like maybe that's a good competitor to the 5600X at much lower pricing, $100 less or more, depending on how it launches and, and the 1,000 unit uh, pricing. That's what all these are, by the way, the 1,000 unit pricing. Typically, you can expect to spend a little bit more than the numbers I've just read off, depending on from whom you're buying the CPU and what volume they move. They might get better deals to get you closer to 1K unit pricing, but uh, if it's from a smaller retailer, definitely expect to pay more than that. So, so far at some of these tiers, there's we have a little bit of uh, cautious hope or optimism maybe for some competition at different price points. 12900 is kind of brutal though, even without looking at it. I don't need to see the performance to know that that is very expensive and that there's price creep in the high end just across the industry. But uh, 12.6 is, is looking more promising. So hopefully we'll be able to look at that for the reviews. From the spec sheet, the first thing that we learned is how Intel is marketing its core account. This was a big question for us, and it's marketing it by adding them. Intel listed the 12900K as being a 16 core CPU, which is maybe technically true, but based on today's marketing, it will be minimally confusing or maximally disingenuous if listed without specificity of the distribution of cores. It'd be sort of like listing Bulldozer as an eight core CPU, except for one critical difference, Intel here is specifying that it's an eight performance core and eight efficient core design, so they're doing the right thing. If, however, you see just 16 cores in a spec sheet somewhere, we would disagree strongly. It needs the distribution marked. Anyway, the 12900K is eight performance and eight efficient. The 12.7 is eight performance and four efficient. That's the only change in the core uh, layout. The 12600K is six performance and four efficient and Intel has one other line item in its spec as well, and that's for the total processor threads. This is where we see that all three of these CPUs are hyper-threaded on the P cores. In terms of what this actually means, obviously the reviews will look at that once we can get all the CPUs in any way. Uh, clock for clock or hard spec for spec, we would anticipate that the 12900K and the 12700K would be very similar in performance or performance core bound applications. That would be most of them you're used to at least the ones that matter, like gaming, uh, high-end production workloads, like video editing, Photoshop, things of that nature. But that's not too different from what we saw from the 11900K and the 11700K, if it's true, where the 11900K proved to actually be, impressively, the biggest waste of silicon we've seen since the AMD XT CPUs and before that, the Lisa Su Edition 2700X. However, Intel still has a chance. We hope that it comes out with a Pat Gelsinger edition of its 12900K, and we hope that the IHS simply says the word leadership right across it, his favorite word. Okay, so there are some other differences aside from the cores. The 12900K runs more cache at 30 megabytes L3 and 14 megabytes L2 compared to the 25 megabytes L3 and 12 megabytes L2 on the 12700K. This alongside frequency uplift, boosting maximally 200 megahertz higher, will be what sets the 12900K apart at least somewhat in performance bound workloads from the 12700K. Its efficiency core bound capabilities should theoretically be better, but we're really not sure yet, not until we can test it. A couple hundred megahertz here and there, it does have a little bit of an impact, but it's not typically worth hundreds of dollars. The cache impacts, you see it in a couple workloads, you might see it in compiling, for example, more noticeably. Uh, you'll see it in some games, but it's that performance core count that's really what will matter the most for the most part. And uh, given that they're the same, we'll see. We'll see how worth it the 12900K is over the 12.7. What Intel samples to media will also be very telling as to what it believes will be received to the best. Although in the past it hasn't sampled some of its best parts, so uh, not necessarily telling. Anyway, we won't know until we can test it firmly and we'll have a review for that, but we do suspect that eight efficient versus four efficient might not matter a whole lot in scenarios where you're playing a game or something and you have 
some other applications on your second monitor off to the side. Because those applications might be like Twitch or YouTube or whatever. An extra four efficient cores maybe doesn't matter so much if all it's doing is keeping some music open, Discord, playing a video, something uh, of that nature. So the E-Core frequency does differ as well. It's by 100 megahertz between the top two or by a noteworthy 300 megahertz favoring the 12700K for the base frequency with uh, bad scheduling, it's feasible that a 12700K could outperform the E-Core performance of the 12900K in some applications. That's really going to come down to scheduling, Windows, Linux, whatever OS you have, though. The 12600K drops another 100 megahertz on boost and 200 megahertz off of E-Core boost. The base E-Core frequency, however, is higher, as is the P-Core frequency base by another 100 megahertz over the 12700K. Cache size drops a bit more noticeably here as well for the 12600K. The 12600K is really what's going to matter for Intel in terms of pricing. Intel has to line itself up to compete with the 5600X and 5800X, which have been what AMD has been pushing the most of uh, since they launched these CPUs, despite being maybe the least exciting, but it's the one that it's had very high availability of. So Intel has to compete there. 12400 will be important. We've seen some leaks of it and uh, of performance if the leaks or benchmarks are to be believed that would compare to a 5600X, which would be more expensive by about $100 plus dollars than the 12400, but that's not confirmed by Intel at this time. Uh, and obviously we would want to confirm it as well with testing. So that's yet to be determined. As for memory, memory support is changing. So uh, DDR5 has been introduced. We talked about this, PCIe Gen 5 DDR5, we talked about in the previous Intel Alder Lake specs and architecture video, but at a harder specs level for product that's coming out, uh, the memory support is DDR5-4800 DDR4-3200 on the Intel Alder Lake SKUs that have been announced today. As a, an important reminder for how this works, first of all, DDR4 and DDR5 are physically different. They will not or should not be made to socket into the other's socket. If you try to force DDR5 into 4, you could probably succeed, but it will very very likely not work anymore, at least the board, if not also the memory. So they are physically different. Do not try to install one with the other. It's just like DDR3 and 4, just pretend they're totally different things entirely. Uh, so that aside, they are both listed in the support list. We're going to explain how this works in case you don't know. The CPU, the chipset, and the motherboard all have different sets of support for different technologies that have to be compatible at some level. So. When you talk about PCIe lanes available on a product, sometimes very frequently people get confused, and it's totally valid to get confused by this. By the way, it took me a little while many years ago, but a little while to, to really understand it. So the, the basics of how it works, the CPU has its own lanes for PCIe graphics. It has some lanes for something like a primary M.2 device. It's got some lanes for maybe wire, wireless devices uh, and things of that nature. The chipset then carries additional HSIO lanes on Intel, so the PCH runs HS, high speed IO, HSIO lanes, where those to some extent can be apportioned out by motherboard manufacturers. So you can assign some, say, four to an extra M.2 slot, and maybe those are Gen 3 or Gen 4, depending on the chipset generation. You can assign uh, another four of them over to SATA or something like that. You can assign some to 10 gigabit Ethernet, some to 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, whatever. So those HSIO lanes are available in higher counts based on the higher end chipsets, typically. Not always, but normally. So D590 versus something like uh, a, a B400 series motherboard, you're going to have some chipset HSIO lane differences. And that's where the big change comes other than BIOS support for things like overclocking. So coming back to the memory support, the CPU list too. That doesn't mean you can use them both at once. Uh, in the past for DDR4 and 3, there was a switchover period where a couple of Intel boards, specifically there's a BioStar one that we tested at the time, had DDR3 and DDR4 slots both on the motherboard. You could not, and this is true with Alder Lake as well, use both of them at the same time. You could choose one, but you couldn't use both. The only reason these boards were really interesting or useful was because they allowed an easier like-for-like -like comparison in all aspects, except for the memory. So if you were really curious about doing a memory comparison, you could do it. But it meant you got two DIMMs per technology. So you could do two DDR3, two DDR4. And in this instance, if one of those types of boards come out, it'll be the same thing. Uh, I'm not aware of any right now. Maybe someone will make one as sort of a fun Frankenstein science experiment. They've never been particularly useful, though, aside from doing controlled testing. But for actual use, you're better off with just four slots of the same type, because, again, you can't mix and match 
four and five. If they are both present on the motherboard, you will only be able to use one set of slots. And that's a giant question mark too, because we don't even know if any board makers are going to do that this time. So anyway, you can run both technologies. Uh, which one you use will come down to the motherboard. When you are shopping for motherboards, pay attention to the memory technology, the slot that's on it. Make sure you buy based on what you want to use. If you want to buy new and use DDR5, match that up. If you want to use some of your old memory to save some money, try and find a DDR4 board. We'll look more at motherboards in the future, though. Today, we're focused on the CPUs. So that's kind of the basics of how that works. Uh, recapping DDR5 physically incompatible with DDR4, and then be aware of what slot you're choosing on the motherboard. And finally, for memory, there are two memory channels for all three of these CPUs and for the entire platform. So Max, you get his dual channel out of anything. Uh, PCIe generations, IGP specs, some other minor details here. All three of the CPUs and their F SKU variants announced today will have 16 PCIe Gen 5 CPU to PEG lane, so that'd be your PCIe graphics. Uh, no GPUs at the moment in the consumer market support PCIe Gen 5, and so you're not going to benefit from this today, maybe in the future, but typically I mean, we're pretty far ahead on PCIe generations versus what's really be able to be extracted from the interface anyway. Uh, PCIe Gen 4, all these CPUs will be running four Gen 4 lanes for M.2 devices. And then for the IGP specs, it's 1550 megahertz IGP Max for the 12.9 series. It's 1500 IGP Max for the 12.7. And then it's 1450 megahertz IGP Max for the 12.600 series of CPUs announced today. Uh, there are miscellaneous other technologies. They are all enabled equally, though. Um, not too important to go over, but it's, it's typical uh, massive list of alphabet soup Intel technologies that they have on there. And finally, the chipset. We already detailed this in our architecture piece. To some extent, it hasn't changed. Uh, so the chipset block diagram, we do have that. We'll put that back up on the screen now. It's probably shown up a few times already. But uh, the chipset shows that we can do off the CPU 2 by 8 PCIe Gen 5. So if you're running NVLink or Crossfire or something, you could do that still. Uh, the chipset will have eight DMI uh, 4.0 lanes to the CPU. There will be 12 PCIe Gen 4 lanes off of the chipset, maximally 16 PCIe Gen 3 lanes. Those can be mapped again to individual PCIe slots of varying lengths up to the motherboards, or they can be mapped to other high-speed devices that can use PCIe. There'll be eight SATA 6 gigabit per second lanes. So that number is decreasing over time now, which makes sense. There's a big, massive mess of USB. We'll put that on the screen. Thanks, USB-IF, for the naming and making it illegible. But we'll put those up there now as well. And there's built-in 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, along with some other internet technologies. So that covers the most important stuff for the announcement today. There is more detail, but it's not really worth getting into. At this point, if you want architecture information, we have a video on that. Uh, you've got product information here. And then if you want performance information, we'll save that for a review. Intel did pass around some slides with performance expectations of how it thinks it will land versus AMD with its own testing. Intel has uh, also proven to us in the past when it contracted principal technologies that we can't really trust its testing data. And then also it went on this whole big anti-benchmarks thing for about a year or two. So we're not going to bother showing their benchmark numbers because Intel spent a few years dismissing benchmark numbers. We'll just do our own and present those to you once the CPUs launch. So uh, looking forward to testing it. It's going to be very complicated to test if we want to look at the E-core and P-core combined performance. It's not quite as simple as it normally is with just one type of core. So that will take some work. And there will probably be a lot of follow-ups from us and everyone else who's reviewing these things as we all figure out how to work with it. Uh, because there's a limited time window before launch, and then you normally need to do some follow-ups. So keep an eye out for all that. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersaccess.net to help us out directly if you'd like, and you get something good in return. We have our toolkits on back order on the store now. If you want to guarantee you get one the next run, you can also go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus for behind-the-scenes videos. Thank you for watching. We'll see you all next time.